certified technician with extensive factory drivability training. Join the motor medics for fun and free automotive advice with real world solutions to everyday automotive problems. The Under the Hood Show is heard weekly on this and other great radio stations across the U.S. Find out how you can participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. With Russ Evans, this is Shannon Nordstrom thanking you for tuning in to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show. Have a great day and remember, PTLA. The opinions heard on this program, based on the many years of experience of Russ and Shannon, are offered for entertainment value only and as a guide to your repair needs. No claim to repair or cause is given or implied. Always consult with your own certified technician and follow all safety procedures before attempting any repair. To be a part of the show, call 866-594-4150. Under the Hood is produced by Prairie House Productions. All content is the property of Nordstrom's Automotive Incorporated and may not be used without our permission. Copyright Nordstrom's Automotive Inc. Now, let's go under the hood with the Nordstrom's Motor Medics. Welcome to the Under the Hood Show. We are glad to have you with us. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. Thanks for joining us, Under the Hood. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. I'm Chris Carter here to answer your calls at 866 594 4150 What's caught your attention in the automotive world? Recalls. Yeah, a lot of recalls, right? My goodness, pay attention to your mail. Watch and your email. We had. You someone, might even have your phone ringing. We had someone post in the, the Facebook group that uh, Hyundai is suggesting in those vehicles you park your car outside just like Ford did Years ago with the Explorer. Was it the Explorer yeah. or a bunch? But if you go, yeah, there was a bunch of them with the cruise control situation. But if you go to our Facebook page, Under the Hood Show on Facebook, you'll see the link to the news story. 380,000 cars uh, with a potential fire hazard. They did say they have not had have one that has had an event that would have been really bad, like burned a garage or a house, mm-hmm. that at least they're talking about. <laughs> but they're, they're, uh, they're telling you, if you're one of these class of cars, you need to pay attention enough that they're saying park your car outside. It's something to do with the electric hydraulic brake system uh, continuing to run, and it is shorting out. And they said if you smell smoke, uh, if you start smelling things, it's an indication you should pay a lot of attention. So get to that Under the Hood Show Facebook page, and you can check out that story. But also in recalls, you know, we haven't talked about Takata for a while, so should we... Should we talk yeah, about Takata? We might as it's been, well. been a while. We're on a roll. But uh, automotive uh, news, uh, looking at their final assembly page here, the headline that caught my attention, Ford is on a costly hunt for 45 bad Takata parts. So, is that enough to catch your attention? <laughs> that's that's encouraging that they, they know that, and also it seems like... Too yes. much. <laughs> so it says here that uh, Ford Motor Company is searching for 45 needles in more than 153,000 haystacks. In this case, the needles are potentially bad Takata airbag inflators that vanished without a trace, and the haystacks are 2004 through 2006. Look how old these are. Ford, as far as, you know, when you look at the grand scheme of things, Ford Rangers that might contain them. Because Ford doesn't know what happened to the obsolete Takata parts, the automaker is recalling 153,107 Rangers at the request of federal regulators. The 45 missing inflators were not purged from f- service stock after the parts for the permanent service fix became available, Ford says. Following extensive investigation and tracing, Ford could not account for some of the obsolete Takata service parts, indicating that they may have been installed on vehicles as part of of collision or theft repairs. Or they could be sitting in a landfill somewhere. Either way, NHTSA says the only way to be sure is to start opening up steering wheels and see what's inside. Just another bizarre and expensive twist in the (laughs) unending Takata airbag airbag saga. And just another reason for auto manufacturers to give that information of what's in what vehicle to people like auto recyclers so they know... Exactly. If they've got their hands on one. But i got to say this really carefully sure. so I'm not harmful to the right person. So let me just think about this bit. <laughs> you know what? We're going to harm somebody every once in a while. Well, no, this, <laughs> this is important. So as a business, let's look at, let's look at a big company. So we've got Ford, GM, 
uh, a box company, whatever it is, a big business says, how much money do I want to spend? Am I going to spend a half a billion dollars to try to get a whole bunch of vehicles in just to take a peek at them to see if they might have something that could potentially be dangerous? And they go, well, I don't know. Is it worth it? But we don't know what they're thinking there. They might say, absolutely, it's worth it. Every customer is important. But as a customer, if you're driving the vehicle, I definitely want them to recall every single one because if I'm the one with a loaded gun pointing at me and they don't know if it's my car or not, do I want to be the one that that happens to? No. So, of course, I want them to recall everyone. But, boy, that's got to be tough when you don't even know where those parts are. I bet they will from the future on, though. They're getting better all the time. Is it still a situation where if you go in for that recall, it could be weeks or months or years well in this case what they're saying is they had service parts available okay. they had a, a group of ranger pickups that were extra bad as far as what would happen when they exploded okay and so they they had put a very high alert out on them and that's what they're talking about is that they had went through this whole campaign very aggressive campaign and they oh no oh no we forgot about the ones in the parts area mm-hmm. they can't figure out where they went so now they've got to start digging. And so this is a interesting situation. Uh, they'll they'll get there. I wonder if they have like a somebody in the shop if they get the right one, if they get to yell Yahtzee or something, you know. <laughs> if do they get like a candy bar or something? Yeah, exactly. There should the... be something. I mean, 45 across the country if you had yep. one. I got one. It's like a golden ticket. Exactly. In a weird way. 866-594-4150. Let's go to Mississippi and talk to Gail. You're on the under the hood show. Gail, what can we do for you? Okay, thanks for calling. You bet. Um, I have a 98 Nissan Frontier. It's a four-cylinder standard, and it's grinding in third and fourth gear. I've taken it to our, a local transmission place, and they checked to see, you know, if the fluid was draining. or. Uh, but they said it was all fine, but he said it's just wearing out. Uh, I bought this truck in 2000, and I've... I don't want to get rid of my truck. I want an antique tag. <laughs> That's what I'm waiting on. Yeah. So, uh, but he said it would it would maybe drive like this for in the year or maybe two years. And he said it would cost twelve hundred dollars to rebuild the transmission. Oof. What? Um, what else could I do? I mean, I, I know it's going to have to be replaced sooner or later. You know, I don't drive my my truck hard. I don't shift it hard, and uh, so when it, I like my little truck. So when it's doing its thing, and the thing that made you go to the shop, you say it's is it grinding excessively? Is it popping out of gear? Is it making lots of noise when, it, when it's in those gears? Combination of all things. What's the worst of the symptoms? It, it's not uh, popping out of gear. Um, it's just it it grind like it has a you know fifth gear. And when I come out of fifth gear and slow down and try and put it in fourth gear, it grinds pretty bad. So I just leave it in neutral and slow down till I can put it in third, you know, and just skip fourth gear, you know, so I don't get that bad grinding. Well, but, it, it, um, it sounds... I'm just kind of worried. Sorry, sorry about that. It sounds like if it is, if they think it's a transmission problem and they've had it there, they've... They've hopefully analyzed the fact to make sure the clutch is working correctly. Um, you know, make sure you got a good clutch that frees up that main shaft so that it can shift. And and but normally when that starts happening, Russ, we see this: the synchronizers start going bad in the transmission, which is basically the blending side of the gear that lets them blend together as you change speed. And the uh-huh. only the only way you get it to shift then is to slow way down when the gears are almost not moving to get them to mesh back together again. So that synchronizer going bad, as that happens, it also knocks off metal material that ends up getting into the rest of the gears and the bearings eventually. And at some point, it'll be a very nasty failure of the transmission. But their advice or their, their information, I think, is accurate. It, it could go that way for quite some time. You could change mm-hmm. the fluid a little bit more often just to get some of the metal particles out of there if you start getting some that they find Uh, on the magnetic plug because that should have a magnetic plug on it and change that a little more often might give you a little more life 
I would want him, though, to make sure the clutch is in good shape and that the shifting tower itself has been inspected so that they're not assuming it's a, a internal gear problem. And it yeah. could be in the shifting tower because on the floor there's a gate system uh, that controls where the shifter goes and stuff. And we do see those where from time to time where it's not quite hitting the right spot, and that makes it grind. So you might want to get that inspected. Uh, Chris, you're just you're you're ready to say something. Well, over I'm there. just want is this a situation where the options are replace it, rebuild it, or it's going to fail? And can she drive it for? gingerly the way she's been driving it can she drive it forever that way maybe not it might just quit i've had one of my own that had a similar trans and as i drove it something fell apart in it and it locked up the rear wheels as i was driving because it dropped it into two different gears at the same time and that can happen i think what i mean is she will it, it might strand her somewhere so keep that in mind but it until it goes it's not going to get worse let me take a shot at this okay because I think I, I, I know what angle you're trying to make sure we get across. If it's just the synchronizers and they think that they have, if they have a local person in their shop that can open that transmission up and fix that transmission, or they have a local shop they sublet it to, it might be $1,200. Okay. If that thing comes completely apart, drops metal in it, locks into gears like Russ is describing, then you're looking at, Oh boy, we got to buy a remanufactured transmission. Maybe that's twenty five hundred dollars, and okay. is the core good enough to give to them at that point? So there are some choices, but to put some some just common sense on it, if you don't drive it hard, you take it easy. It probably is going to stay that way for quite a while. But do understand that it could be a just one day thing that it's a lot worse. Gail, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. The phone number to reach us, Now, now, now. now it will, yeah. yeah we're in a break. Hey, here. welcome to the Under the Hood show. Uh, we're in a break, and we've had a lot of comments from people who, when you can't hear during the break and you see the little things since you don't know, we thought maybe we should talk a little bit yeah. and let you know we're still here during the break. So today we threw another one up. We're on Instagram. We're oh, yeah. on Facebook Live and on YouTube. So if you're on any of those, we are live. This is Thursday. and What is it's the 11th. Is this today oh. the 11th? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, Thursday, March 11th. Um, I just had a quality voice crack there. That was yeah, full on, yeah. Yeah, it's well, it's my kids would be really making fun Central of me right now. Right now, 920. So you can call us right now if you've got a car question at 866-594. Oh, I'm gone. Oh, you're there. You're there. I Keep am going. There? Oh, 866-594-4150. It's right on the screen, so I don't even know why I need to give you that. But um, Well, you just should. That's what, they can't hear that now. That's what I was trying to do there. That's why I turned you off for a minute. So we I'm can really hear freaking going. out because I'm getting noise from different directions. But that's okay. You're fine. That's all right. Yeah. Just the cue playing in our in our ears. So, so we can what hear what's doing. happening back. Because right now we're streaming live to Kello AM 1320 in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Mm -hmm. So as we sit here right now, we're doing what you might be seeing if you're watching on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube. Mm -hmm. We are also live to AM 1320, FM 107.9 in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And then all this content is being captured, and that's where we'll create the syndicated show, our podcasts. And so this is, uh, this is where it all happens. As What do you call it in our press release? The epicenter of automotive broadcasting? I don't know. Something I don't like think that? I did. I think you did. No, one of your edits <laughs> okay. was epicenter of oh. automotive that broadcasting. Great. That sounds search your search your dial where we're at locally too, because we air on over two hundred and forty radio stations across the country. So you can find all those stations at underthehoodshow dot com, but you can also just maybe search your dial on FM and AM on a on a Saturday, Sunday, yep. see what you got, and you might be surprised and go, Hey, there it is. I always I always get surprised when I'm in a place like Florida on vacation and I'm in the rental car and I flip the radio on and I go, Whoa. That's yeah. weird. That's me. I'm uh -huh. I'm here, and that's playing. It just seems Well, you guys odd. saw the email I sent you from Roger Ross, my friend from Wisconsin. Yeah. 
Him, him and his wife have retired, and they're cru- right. cruising the motorhome. Lake Havasu, Hoas Havasu, he hears us like, hey. Get your planner out right now and schedule your next radio appointment with the Motor Medics. Welcome back to the Under the Hood Show. We're glad to have you with us. 866-594-4150. We are at the Nordstrom's 2.0 new Under the Hood Show studio. And there, that was, I think, our first, what just happened was our first full-on error by me. Oh, really? Yeah. We just, I just made, I think, the first technical error of the, of the new era. You so, pushed the button wrong or what? I, I didn't push in the middle. It, it happens. No, uh, I right. had the wrong thing pushed there. So now we're back. Now we're fine. 866-594-4150. That's the phone number to reach us. I was uh, coming to the studio today from the other studio where I spend my days. And I kind of had one of those moments where I, we had snow yesterday, we had rain, we had all sorts of stuff going on. It was gross. Yeah. And I got in my car that I'm driving my wife's car today. It's been in the garage for, I don't know, how long, a week. Were all the tires aired up? Yeah, I did that yesterday. I got the thing going and we had snow, we had, I mean, it was kind of not great out there. But I got on the road. I went 80 miles an hour on the interstate. It was Le- all legally, clear. Yeah. Legally. Here. Yeah, it was all clear. Everything was, the road had been pre-treated and the ice was off to the side. That, uh, we, we really have got this down, don't we? The auto- automobiles and roads. I mean, we are pretty good at that. For the most part. Yeah. Yeah, unless you're more eager than the system. Right. Yeah, that happens. I've then, seen that. Then it's still old school. Mm-hmm. But that's, ha- you know, there's some people that have to go for that early, early shift. Yeah. For that's whether for they sure. work at the hospital or a plant somewhere, and they've got to be the one there. They've got to be there at 3 a.m. to make sure everything's up and going for everybody else that comes at 5 a.m. or whatever it might happen to be. Most people still sometimes have to find mm-hmm. some very interesting situations. 866 594 4150. Let's go to Braxton in Idaho. Braxton, you're on the end of the hood show. What can we do for you? Hey, guys. Appreciate your program. Thanks. I've got a 2015 GMC Sierra with a 5.3 in it. I've got a problem with the fans kicking on, the cooling fans. Um, it's 16 degrees out here this morning right now, and I'll go out and start it up, and I'll go for maybe a half a mile, and my fans kick on. And it will roar for probably a good half hour, 45 minutes. It will fade out, come back on, and then go off the rest of the day. I've changed the temperature sensor. I changed the low pressure sensor on the AC unit. I told them well, that could be a problem, and I've switched up the thermostat. And this thing just continually does this to me all the time. The dealer has no idea. They put it on this on the scanner. Um, it doesn't show. It doesn't show fail code anywhere. No check engine light. Um, I've checked my wiring. I'm kind of mechanically inclined. I went back and I owned all through my wires. Everything's good. I can't find a short anywhere. But maybe you guys might have an idea what's going on. Yeah, so the uh, the cooling fan circuit on that, it, the engine computer controls the speed of that. It's running the, the circuit. It's pulse width modulated, so it's telling that fan module run at certain times. If there's ever a code in the system anywhere, it's going to turn the fans on to protect things and keep them cool. So you need to kind of reverse engineer this. When you start it up and it's acting up, first thing we do is after we do our scans and find that we don't see anything is we get a a meter that will read pulse width modulation. We go right there to the fan controller and we look and see, do I actually have a pulse width signal at my fan controller? And if I do, then I'm going to go back to the engine computer and I'm going to check right at the output. And I'm going to see, do I have a pulse width signal there? And if I have it there, I might even remove it from the fans. I might just take the pin okay. and unclip it so it's pulled out of there. Or you can cut it and splice it back together. Oh, that would scare spli- me. Splice, it's that not going to hurt me. anything. But, but you can take <laughs> it off. If the fans immediately stop, <laughs> you're reading your scanner, right? And your scanner says fans are not on. They're at 0%, nothing on at all. But it's sending a pulse width signal out. That means the computer is bad. So if I can 
if computer it says, bet. oh boy, yeah, if the computer and that they're not bad. Uh, used one's going to cost. It's definitely reprogrammable. Used one's probably going to cost you maybe seventy bucks or so is is average from CarDashPart dot com. Okay. You can put it in, have it reprogrammed. Most dealers are probably going to be around a hundred bucks in your area, so a couple hundred bucks. Now, so what, what's what do you call this thing you're talking about again? I'm just trying to write this down real quick. The engine computer. The engine computer, the whole thing. Yep. If that if that is bad. Um, so what's happening is if it's okay. sending out, if it says it's not commanding the fans on, if it says 0% for fan control on your scanner, but you have a signal coming out of it, pulse width signal coming out, telling those fans to turn on, then it's, then that part is bad. It's, it's, it's okay. lying. It's saying, no, we're not on, yep. but it is. But the, the, it's you kind know, of ironic because I live 45 miles away from my dealer, and by the time I get there, it will work and fine. <laughs> right, right. And they could check it if it was showing up, but that would mean 45 minutes to leave it there. You'd have to get a ride home. They'd have to check it the next morning when it's cold. Yeah. One of the things that when Russ brings this up, we can do this at our independent repair facility in, in rural Garrison, South Dakota. Someone near you can also do this. It, it doesn't have to sure. be the franchise dealer to do this test. Also, no, I understand that. It's just that's how far away I live from anybody. That but we can, can do this you know, stuff. like at our so. shop, we could program the computer, correct? Oh yeah. So there are people that could be nearer to you. Now, don't just go buy a computer, right? Because what the important part about Russ, what he said is, you have to know whether that comp- if that is being commanded on or not. So it has to be read right. live, right? Because if it's if it is being commanded on by another circuit, say something's wrong in the temp temp control circuit. Because in a lot of vehicles, when you go to the defrost mode, which on cool mornings on defrost, the fans may kick in. And, and it could be something coming from another circuit that's saying, turn on. And you could be replacing all this stuff, and maybe it's doing something that it's supposed to do. That would be horrible. But it, this sounds way different. But you got to make sure where that command is coming from. And if there's no command and you still got a signal, yeah, then it's coming from inside that box. Braxton, thanks very much for the call. Does that help you out there? Helps me a lot. Thanks, guys. Appreciate Thanks. your show. Yeah, that's the thing. With those things, those are, I think, sometimes the most frustrating as a car owner when it's just you don't know why it's doing it, and the only way to get it solved is for a couple things to happen right. You know what I mean? I went up and did a presentation at a driver's ed class, and the instructor was asking me uh, about his Ford Edge, and he's got the issue where when he puts gas in it and after he fills it, then he starts it up and it acts like it's it's just not running right. And he's got to check engine light on, but we were just talking it through. I said, you know, at the end of the day, if you can't we almost have to let we almost have to let the technician fill it with gas. We'll charge charge you for the gas yep. and have the scanner on it when he starts it to see exactly what's going on. Yeah. Right. See what's going on. To duplicate that. Otherwise, we could just be guessing. I think you should be a mobile. You should go live with people for a week when it get you know, like the spring. In spring, I have a hard time. Start, so you go move in with them for a. Maybe a post-COVID yeah. business. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Mo- let's let's keep the mobile down now. We're gonna take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you, David. You're up next on the Under the Hood Show. 866-594-4150. Be sure to visit our website for news, contests, and previous shows at underthehoodshow.com. Welcome back, everybody. It's time to get back under the hood with the Motor Medics. Welcome back to the Under the Hood Show. We're glad to have you with us. You can also join us on Facebook. We do some Facebook Live videos there. We put the podcast there. You can check it all out. And if you like the Facebook page and go to underthehoodshow.com and join the Hoodie Fan Club, you could win a hoodie. Like Holly Brady, who listens to us in Corinth, Mississippi. Congratulations from all of us here under the hood and our friends over at Universal Technical Institute, uti.edu. They're the people who can help you out when you want to be mechanics like us. Mm-hmm. You know, you want to work on cars, you want to work on boats, you want to learn welding, you want to uh, maybe even get into NASCAR tech. Uh, they're going to help you out. They've got full training available. They've got GIB bill, GIB, G-I-B-I-L-L. The B-I-B-L-E. Uh, GI bill help available as well. They've got representatives there that uh, work. They work right with the factory. So you're getting that information that the uh, 
with the factories having these manufacturers on all the latest tech on cars. So check them out at uti.edu. I'm trying to get my daughter to go there. She's going to college next year, and I'm trying to push her towards Universal Technical Institute, and I think it might be NASCAR Tech that that finally gets that in the the conversation. She'd be good. She'd be good at that. You know, mm-hmm. um, a, a lot of uh, women and even guys uh, that are uh, think I don't want to do heavy lifting or I don't want to get my hands really dirty. Think I'll never get a career in automotive, but I'd, I'd say, whoa, back up. Look at the stuff available, especially with electric vehicles and technology that's changing there are a lot of hands-on no grease no dirt wear a white lab coat type scenarios in automotive right now where you're scanning cars you're working with electrical you're not working you just described me and not my daughter (laughs) i totally i think (laughs) when you start talking i was looking at chris like why are you laughing and smiling what's (laughs) going on what's going on here i could wear i could wear a white coat and gloves i could do that i can't see you in a white lab coat and gloves well, let's later. I got one in the car. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to David. David, you're on the end of the hood show. What can we do for you? You still there, David? Well, let's try. I'm going to try and put him back on hold. Let's try this. Let's see if we can talk to Rick in Nebraska. Rick, you're on the end of the hood show. What can we do for you? Huh. Did I screw something else up? I don't think I did. Well, you know, it's yeah, a new, we got some new toys in here. So sometimes when you push the, the new toys, you, you miss out on something from I'm time to try time. This one more. I'm going to try this quick. He's going to try pushing the button to the left of the button to the left. That's what I have to do. It's, I have to. it's the one to the left of the one to the left, Chris. I'm restarting our phone system. That Isn't sounds major. Exciting? Yeah, that, yeah. That sounds major. You know, what it's, what's cool about our phone system is that if we shut it down while people are there on hold, it comes back up and they're still there. That's even it, cooler, it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't drop them off. As he's working on that, I want to mention you may have heard uh, a new sponsor this morning uh, listening on the local show, but uh, iState Truck Center uh, just out here on 60th Street uh, outside of Sioux Falls. We have used them for the last few years as our go-to to to get the trucks that we need for our delivery fleet. We've expanded our deliveries for our automotive business and Nick in the sales department and the people that he worked with in the service department, Jeff back there in the body shop and service department, those guys have been great for us. They have, they've stepped up when we've needed them. They've helped us find some hard to find equipment when we needed it to get a new truck put on the road. They've helped me because I switched my fleet over to gas from diesel because we're able to recycle the gasoline and we wanted gas powered delivery trucks. Plus we didn't want that extra expense and maintenance of the diesel trucks, which all of a sudden is a trend because we talked about this on the show, how expensive it is to maintain a diesel vehicle. If you don't need a diesel vehicle, you do need to do that gut check about whether or not that is the best thing for you, because there is added maintenance expense. There is added expense uh, when you're you're broke down and things need to be fixed. The engine can be a lot more expensive. Uh, The fuel injectors, those sort of things can add up in a hurry, and you get bills that are like... (laughs) But uh, we've really had a lot of uh, success working with iState, and they have been really good for us with their Azuzu program, and we're very excited uh, to help them spread the word to our hoodies about what they've done for us. Speaking of, let's transition into uh, what was shared on the Facebook page just recently, another diesel tuner company. Ooh, I I didn't see this. Yeah. Did you see that? I, I didn't read all of it, but I heard that the one was coming. They're, they're really cracking down. I, was, it, was that in our group or was that on our main page? Yep. Yeah, he says. It's on one of those. Okay. Uh, basically, if, if you're a company that's making something that doesn't meet the EPA regulations, and then finally, if you're an end user, you or I or whoever's using a car that has a tuner in it, or any type of emissions defeating of ice, you've removed the catalytic converter. Well, it hasn't been stolen. Sorry, I mean it, you've actually intentionally removed it because there's so many thefts going on recently. Um, they're, they're they're starting to come after people, and it's it's snowballing. It's it's not just like oh maybe we'll do it. They they're getting there, and the the way the government's doing it, we see them doing all sorts of wacky stuff recently. They. They they want to get everybody. That's their intention because it's a it's a source of income for them. They they made the laws that said 
car can't pollute more than this. And then they put these, some of the stupid stuff out there just really, some of it's crazy. Uh, and when I say stupid stuff, for instance, there are laws that say you cannot take an old vehicle that was a super polluting car and put a brand new modern fuel injected drivetrain in it where you have maybe a tenth or less, maybe one twentieth of the emissions coming out the tailpipe because it's, it's not the factory engine. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, and to the, you know, to the cause of justification too, there are companies like SEMA and the SEMA show that they're working with the government saying, look, we should be able to certify a lot of these project cars and street rods and things because they are cleaner. And the goal is let's get cleaner cars out there to protect the environment. So they are, they're working there, but they're, we're going to see a lot of crackdown coming. One of the things I saw, one of the uh, discussions was that the, the, su- the suspicion is that when it, this happened a few years ago and then the government laid low <laughs> to let more companies build up more violations and more money so then they could go after them. Instead of shutting down little guys, they wait until they get to be big guys and then go after them. So it has, it has put a lot of those out. Of, or last time we went through this, I mean, I'm sure it's ongoing too, but when we've talked about it in the past, businesses went out because they couldn't, well, for, and they couldn't pay their fines, et cetera, but the, also what they were doing was illegal at its start. I did a quick look on my phone. I normally won't do that because this is interesting that you brought that up. Because a lot of times people are regurgitating news that's old that's new to them. Right. Right. So I, I always so I always like to check that. I did that exact thing when I saw the story to make sure it was a current what, story. What the timeline is. And so, yeah. so many people will forward something like, oh, look at this. And you look at the timeline, 2017. Yeah. Yep. But in this case, uh, the EPA alert cites, and this was from j- just January, very recently, $2 million fine levied against Rockwater Northeast, a Pennsylvania-based hauling service, and related $2.3 million fine on Select Energy Solutions, a Texas-based successor in interest to Rockwater. In that case, six people were charged with conspiring to violate the Clean Air Act by using aftermarket defeat devices on about 30 heavy-duty trucks. The case also resulted in one defendant being sentenced in February to a six-month prison sentence. Last year, Deltona, Florida-based Punch It Performance and Tuning, Michael Paul Schimmick and affiliated companies and individuals were fined $850,000 for manufacturing and selling pickup truck products that altered engine performance and enabled the removal of filters, catalysts, and other critical emission controls. And this, that, this, that wasn't the one I no, saw. And, I and, and, and this follows the 2019 $1.1 million judgment against Performance Diesel, which the EPA says sold at least 5000 549 aftermarket defeat devices for heavy-duty diesel engines. And it goes on to talk about it more, but there's, there must be something else out there that we, we hadn't gotten wind of, but we'll have to check that out. Now let's try this. David, you're on the End of the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for taking the call. Say, I got an 05 McCormick tractor. Uh, the lights all over it, front and back. And when they're on dim, they work fine, but when I either put the work lights on or put them on high beam, I get this hot electrical smell. I don't know if you know what I mean. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I took, I took the hood off uh, or the dash off, and there's these four, uh, they're about an inch by inch. I don't think they're fuses, but they pull out. And two out of the four were really hot. So I bought new ones for about 70 bucks and replaced them. Uh, but I'm still getting the smell. I don't know if that's where the smell was coming from, but what, what do you guys think that might be? I just want to ask one question before we jump on this. What year did you say it was? You said 05. 05. And, and what kind of tractor? It's a McCormick. Okay. And you've added these lights, right? All the, the high beam no, lights? No, no it's, that's all come standard with okay. them. Okay. Here. I have a question. When, you, when yeah. you discovered the fuses were hot, did you discover it right away, or was it after you had a good grip on them, and then all of a sudden it triggered that they were hot? <laughs> no, I just I was just smelling around and and they were in there way, so I couldn't really get my head in there. But they they were hot, a lot hotter than the other ones. Well, the other ones were just warm, you know. But the two little ones, they were really hot. This is a problem with a a lot of vehicles that were, in my opinion, just designed poorly. Uh, they they didn't give enough 
contact areas and wire gauge for some of the circuits that they have in them. My truck is one of them. If you ran the thing on high beam for more than about 15 minutes, which can happen in some rural areas, it doesn't mean every day. Yeah, exactly, Chris. So, but for 90% of the country, it probably doesn't happen. But if you're in an area and you drive at night and it's on, well, what happens is my headlight switch would start to melt and I'd have to replace it every couple of years. Um, some vehicles like certain Jeeps have issues with the blower fan and some of the, the Sierra trucks had blower fan issues where if you ran it on high too long, it would start melting the wires. So to get around that, extra relays need to be put in. Now you could put in a relay that's heavy enough. You need, you need to get an amp meter and find out how, find the wire that powers those high beams, see how much amps you're drawing. And if you look at it and if, if you see, um, that you're pulling, let's say 29 amps on that thing. Now you know how many amps you have. That is making your wire hot. So you would get a relay that had enough current available to handle that. Let's say a 40 amp relay and you hook the lights to one side of it with the right gauge wire. The other side, you hook directly to your battery with the correct fuse to cover that. And then your headlight wire that was going directly to the lights before, well, that's going to turn your relay on. So now you've taken all the load off of that headlight wire, the headlight switch, and all your fuses, and now you're not going to have a problem with them getting warm ever again. And the relay is going to be handling that load. That's where it's going to take the current. And what you're going to have to make sure of, though, would be when you start that process, on the lighting circuit, make sure it makes sense. If you've got six lights and you know each one's rated at whatever amps, do the math and see if it's close. If you've got excessive amp draw on that circuit, there may be a wire something pinch else. running through the body of the cab. There could be something that, that is yep. causing it to grab that load. Or did someone add an aftermarket accessory somewhere else that got tapped into the lighting circuit that wasn't supposed to? Those or change are, the bulbs? Oh, okay. You know, there, yeah. Yeah, changing to upgraded bulbs will also do that. A lot of people will switch out their standard headlight bulb for an aftermarket one that takes more current, and that'll that'll cause that problem too. Which so, is something to check for. Yeah, and so you don't want to find, okay, what's this circuit supposed to be? And all of a sudden, maybe this circuit's running 20 amps hotter than it's supposed to. You're gonna, Yeah, you're going to heat some stuff up because it wasn't designed for that, but I think Russ hit it on the head. A lot of that stuff just is not engineered correctly, or they engineer it so tight to save costs that they don't leave any room for error. And since he brought it up, just going to bring it up one more time, on a lot of vehicles, he talked about adding different bulbs that add more resistance to the circuit. On a lot of this modern stuff, you'll run into more problems when you add the LED bulbs with less resistance. And some of those circuits are looking for a certain amount of resistance to operate correctly. And all of a sudden, people will put in LED bulbs, and if they don't, sometimes you have to put a resistor with them, different things. So when you start switching bulbs, always pay attention to what is going to happen for the rest of the circuit. David, thanks very much for the call. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. 866-594-4150. Ken, you're up next on the Under the Hood Show. Yeah, so our plan to talk during the break backfired on me. So we'll have to figure can, that out. Can we do it for a shorter period of time and then just Yeah, quit? I think so. Yeah. yeah, we'll see. Yeah, let's try it. Just we're so ready. people know we're here. Uh, hey, so if you're on this video right now, whatever platform you're on, please subscribe. Hit that subscribe button and turn on the notifications so you know when we're coming. I had a couple of people say, well, I didn't know you're on the next week, so I, I missed it. Well, just hit the notifications button. But even if you don't do that, please hit the subscribe button at least. You could ignore us if you want, but hit subscribe so other people know it's there and Share it and yeah. tell people about Should it. Should I do that right now? Just, uh, you ahead. haven't been? Sharing it? It doesn't. Well, yeah. you could share it, but it doesn't do any good if you subscribe to your own stream. You know, it's really kind of pointless. All right, I'm going out now. We're right. going off the break. We'll see you soon. Thanks, subscribe, everybody. Please. <laughs> Learn something. You're going under the hood. Welcome back to the Under the Hood Show, 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Ken, who's been waiting for a while. Ken, you're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? 
Hey guys, one of your favorite things, the <laughs> catalytic converter. <laughs> well, now, one of my biggest questions is uh, the brand new, um, I think it's like 15 years old. I thought it was like ceramic coating instead of platinum for these ca catalytic converters. Is that true or what's going on? There are certain converters that use ceramics inside of them, and they have a higher content. That's what I thought. Yeah, but... they have a higher content of those uh, versus the the precious metals, and they they also use that ceramic to kind of contain the the puck of precious metals, so they don't have to have so much. I believe is how that works, because when we send our catalytic converters in to be assayed, which is the process of breaking them down and filtering out the precious metals, uh, we get a count on what percentage of ceramics are in our load. And so I've never completely understood that, but there definitely is ceramic properties used in many of them. Now, there's also, when you go to buy a catalytic converter for replacement and you buy one from, say, brand X at a muffler store that is aftermarket, there are many of those that are EPA legal compliant, but there are many of those that are probably not correct because they just don't have the material in them. There's a reason why they cost a lot less. Let's just mm -hmm. put it that way. Okay. And they may not have the material in them to do a full range of catalyst effect that, it's, that it needs. It'll still, how do you say that, Russ? It'll it keeps the light off, but it's not cleaning the air the way it should. And it says right on there when you buy it, it says, does not meet EPA regulations, even though it's a catalytic converter. Is it a situation where they might make it just good enough to do it for a, a certain oh, yeah. car and then... Well, no, it'll, certain, it'll last for a certain yeah, period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you've got, let's say it's a used car, you want to sell it and the light has to be off or you want to pass emissions in your state, you throw one of these on and it works. Maybe it's only good for a year or two and then it's off. Well, if you're getting rid of the car, people are doing that as opposed to spending... Uh, you know, thousands of dollars on one. But as a shop, when we install them, we have to install the good one that says it meets EPA rules because I have not seen a paper with legislation that specifies it says must have a working catalytic converter. I would venture to guess if you in intentionally install one on a car that says does not meet EPA regs, I think you would still be in violation of violating the rules. So I'd hope they'd say you gave it a good attempt. They'd go, oh, nice try. Yeah, the, Let's try because again. the government's always good about giving <laughs> yeah. people a pass for a good attempt. They always take the the situation and I, I, the majority, the highest majority of consumers, unless they're hoodies, probably would have no clue of that. They'd just know that they got a new catalytic converter and they'd be fine with it. And we've done it on our own vehicles from time to time. Well, you know, we had things that went to a shop and they said, you know, hey, we have this option. And we're like, okay, and we, but. To admit that I ever went down and said, would you show me the box of that option you put on there so yeah. that I can study the box and read mm -hmm. all the labeling and call the company and make sure what content it has? I didn't. But it, I it, just wanted to know how much it cost. If right? he's asking, is there a way that they can go with a completely like a ceramic alternative so there's no precious metals in there, maybe someday they'll figure it out. But if they do, these morons are still going to steal them and go, oh, what do you mean it's worth nothing? I should get money for it because they're... That hits the nail on the head because the majority of the, of the thieves that are out there right now, some of them probably are smart enough to know what vehicles to hit because they've got a more valuable content in them. But many of them are going to be looking for things that are easy to steal and they may get one that's a total dud and I'm just smiling all the way to that crook having to deal and with it <laughs> like the diesel ones that are worth nothing because yep. they're they're not converters basically and they're, they're what they're doing is they're causing when they take off those dpf systems off these trucks they're not getting any money for them and they're costing the owner and the insurance company thousands of dollars you could have uh, we had one that had an engine destroyed when they tried to cut the they thought they were getting a converter off it in a motorhome and they ended up cutting the engine block so you know <laughs> It's crazy. They took one off my mom's car, which was worth that converter. You know, we've we've replaced those and turned them in, and they're worth like thirteen bucks. They're completely worth nothing, but it cost us eight hundred dollars to have it replaced. It it just doesn't make sense. But they hear that there's something of a value, so they steal it. They do make a lock, and I don't know how effective it is. But Shannon and I saw this thing 
way back in 2014. It was a cable that wrapped around the converters and then clipped and made it extremely hard for, uh, even if they could get the pipe cut, they couldn't get the converter out of the vehicle. Yeah, with I this. forgot about that. That would be that would be a deterrent. Yeah, with that cage on there, but I, I just don't know how. A friend of mine in Texas um, that has, owns another auto recycling facility, he has a lot of trucks on the road, and like Russ said, parts of that DPF system are worth nothing. Other parts of it have some pretty high content in, in that system. And so they were oh, getting theirs shush, cut off. Shush, shush. Don't say that. Go ahead. They got heavy log chain mm-hmm. and wrapped it around oh. the exhaust and welded it all the way around. They welded it from, you know, every few inches they put yeah. a weld on it and they put that log chain around there. Yes. Could you still cut through it? Yeah. But you're going to have a heck of a time. Well, um, and the, another thing they need to do, and this is my opinion, Shannon to know more because he is an auto recycler. If somebody comes here with uh a pickup load or even we don't even we don't buy two them. converters yeah our rule is we don't buy them but we do know for a fact there are companies out there that will take them and they'll just throw them in the pile in the back and they'll say um yeah scrap metal and they'll give them money for it under the table basically and then they'll take them and turn them in as their legal ones and that is wrong and i if no, they, that's full full wrong well, that's yeah whenever anybody gets caught wrong. like that's that wrong, wrong. They should just be really strung up because that is that is something that is. Hey, you need costing. to get rid of the market. The, the, yeah, the, the market, yeah, market sure. and then you can stop the theft. It's just so much money that's, that's that. Uh, somebody there. Were, that was a story on Facebook the other day, and someone said that. Who are these people that are buying them? They should get in trouble. Well, yeah, they would. If they're we not, knew. <laughs> yeah, they're they're doing it. I mean, it's not a legal process that's being exploited. The same process in most states that's been passed for if you buy scrap. Copper or scrap aluminum mm. needs to be applied to catalytic converters if it isn't already in their law. So that way, if somebody brings in a, a content that's worth more than, like in our state, I think it's more than $100, you have to provide ID and all those things, and it has to be a log that's kept by the buyer. And so that is, you know, our our threshold is the same way on a catalytic converter if somebody brings them in. Because at our pull it, we do have a board of trade where we let people bring things in, but we don't pay very much for them. And if it's over 100 bucks, you're given full identification or we're not taking them. We should get under the hood show branded signs. Remember, you used to put a sign up that said car, no stereo in car. Yeah. No catalytic convert, catalytic converter on the car. Or detachable face plates on the catalytic converter. Detachable converters. There you we take go. Take them with you when you leave. <laughs> the under the hood show is brought to you by Sturdivant's Auto. Just adjusting it. All right, now we're on in the just, break. Just a little bit of adjustments, technical adjustments. I'll be back. I'm tweaking. <laughs> Where are you going? This is behind the scenes. Are, I yeah, have to go talk to uh, the producer over in the other studio. I'm gonna. I'm staying here. I'm, I'm not going anywhere. Well, there are people on the air. Say hi to that horse. <laughs> oh man, I'm okay. Uh, now look at this. I'm entertaining without me, boys. <laughs> I'm. I'm talking. Over, I'm over here making adjustments. I should just move my camera. So if I talk over here, will it give us some picture? Yeah. There we go. Or I can there we go. Click this button here, and you could. Uh, no, I can't do that. Can you do the all studio button? Or that just screw things up. No, nah, I could do that, but I'm not going to right now. I'm just going to let you. Well, well, we've got some time here. Let me tell you a joke. No, no, no. You don't, you don't want me please, to tell you. Please, a joke. no, uh, no jokes. I'm just going to adjust this thing. And Doug, see you want to come and oh, say hi? That sounds horrible. Don't do that, Russ. Yeah. Oh no, he got an empty chair. Oh yeah, you're getting the you're getting the blank chair over over there yeah. because I'm I'm uh I'm there it is there, there it is oh, Doug, that... right there look at there's the empty chair. I'm trying trying to make some tuning adjustments here. So what do you think? Does that sound, Shannon? You can hear myself in your headphones. What does that sound better? Does that sound better than this down here like this or up here like this? I can't tell a difference. You can't. Producer Doug can. Yeah. I I like it. Yeah. Camera three. Camera four. Camera three? No, it's the eyeglass thing. Camera one, camera two. Camera we one, have one camera. and two, and two and one, and one and two. People are going to be, they're going to be like, what? what is going on I there? need to I go in know. for an eye doctor appointment, by the way. It's time. Well, when you're trying to read and hear, you're, I, I see you going, I, I can't see anything. Well, I need more light, because we put on the mood lights during the show, because we like a romantic feel to it. I don't. Oh, oh we don't. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, our goal is to keep you here during the break. 
Well, I, we may scare them away, Russ. We don't want them to think that we've gone, that we've we've left them and gone AWOL because we are actually still we're actually still here because we take a break at the top of the hour and at the bottom of the hour. Because when you get a podcast from us, it's just you know you got your hour and you don't get the in between piece and the rest of it's been cleaned up and all that. But when we're here doing the live show and laying down our live product, we're in studio for two hours. And we're streaming back to Kelo AM 1320 in Sioux Falls and 107.9 FM in Sioux Falls. 105.1. Yeah, 105.1. All of them. And so when we do that, we're still here, but you may not get that. So we are, we're, we're finishing up our new studios here. We're just getting down uh, some of the things we need to add in here. What do you think we should put in here? Let's just That's just a quick question. You can leave your comments there on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube. What do you think you'd like to see in the studio? I got one thing going in in the corner back there behind Stop Chris. Stop talking and start chalking. That's what I think. She'd I am here. not moving my eight ball what? deluxe machine up here. Let's. No, it'd be. I would want to go play it. Every time I get near it, I want to turn it on and play a game. Sure. I got one dead flipper right now. I got to figure out. Oh yeah, that it's got. I got a them. lazy flipper. Yep. It's oh, up, I know. It's hanging and yep. won't go back all the way. And so I got I got to work on that. Shannon's are you, secretly a fish, and we didn't know. Are you <laughs> lazy flipper? It is, isn't it? Isn't that the worst feeling in the world when your pinball machine has like that? It has a flipper problem, and it's just sitting there. It, you never wanted to play oh, it no. as bad as when it exactly. And then I had a good game going the other night. I was playing mm-hmm. it, and all of a sudden it came down and hit that dead flipper. And usually yeah. I would let it hit the flipper, and then you kind of catch it to let it roll back yep. so you can get that perfect shot at the target. And it just hit the flipper and went. Duh. I'm like. Oh. So sad. Have you taken the tilt balls out of yours? I have not <laughs> taken. Have my, you even oh, looked in the side oh, yeah, machine? Oh, no, I've had it open many times. I, I think had, they're so cool when you open them up. And I, my neighbor had yeah, one so, when I was in Michigan. So when it's like inside. six, I'm and I opened surprised. it up, and I went, "Wow, well, this is an old one." And well, it, no, it but his point is the stuff. case is so much larger. Yeah, oh yeah, a lot of room. But in there. All that stuff that was in there, it was like, oh, this is so cool. Yeah, my del- eight ball. We're going back now, are we? My machine has got so many wires. I don't dare touch them. I'm afraid they'll just break. Absolutely. I have a jukebox that gets it's not working right now, and it's, it's I, I, oh boy. Where are we going? We're going off here. All right, we'll be back. Hour two coming up. You're listening to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show with the Motor Medics, Shannon Nordstrom and Russ the Super Tech Evans. Shannon is an ASE engine and parts specialist, and Russ is an ASE master certified technician with extensive factory drivability training. Join the Motor Medics for fun and free automotive advice with real world solutions to everyday automotive problems. The Under the Hood Show is heard weekly on this and other great radio stations across the U.S. Find out how you can participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. With Russ Evans, this is Shannon Nordstrom, thanking you for tuning in to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show. Have a great day, and remember, PTLA. The opinions heard on this program, based on the many years of experience of Russ and Shannon, are offered for entertainment value only and as a guide to your repair needs. No claim to repair or cause is given or implied. Always consult with your own certified technician and follow all safety procedures before attempting any repair. To be a part of the show, call 866-594-4150. Under the Hood is produced by Prairie House Productions. All content is the property of Nordstrom's Automotive Incorporated and may not be used without our permission. Copyright Nordstrom's Automotive Inc. Now, let's go Under the Hood with the Nordstrom's Motor Medics. Welcome to the Under the Hood Show. We are glad to have you with us. I'm Chris Carter, here to answer your calls at 866-594-4150. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. Thanks for joining us under the hood. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. You can always find us at underthehoodshow.com and on our Facebook page. Thanks for listening to the Under the Hood Show. The phone number, 866-594-4150. What's caught your attention in the automotive world? Well, I think some people are sick of talking about it, but not long ago we had a horrendous cold snap and it caused mm-hmm. all kinds of problems it went clear to the south and we had just the people down in the south that are not prepared now it's flooding and record warmth for that kind of temperature had things breaking and and lots of stuff happening but one of the stories that were automotive related that caught a little bit of press and i think it's worthy of a little bit more here on the under the hood show was how ford 
was able to deploy, and people that had bought the new F-150 hybrids were in high demand to use their onboard generator function of the pickup. Right. And so they had a, a story here in Automotive News, and it said that uh, the pro power on board, the value of it became very apparent last week when the winter, st- or when the, this is a recent story, when the winter storms crippled the power grid in Texas. Right in the heart of pickup country, you know, mm-hmm. this, is the, this is a big deal. So this generator can do up to 7.2 kilowatts, and it, uh, he, people are putting their refrigerator, their microwave, things that they needed to run in the back of the trucks and keeping things going. So this gen- gentleman they talked to, Randy Jones, he's a retired refinery worker. He thought the 7.2 kilowatt generator on the F-150 hybrid he bought a few weeks before might be helpful during hurricane season. When the power went off last week, he said the truck performed flawlessly, using only about six or seven gallons of gasoline while running from about 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. every day. Some of his neighbors used the truck to change their phone and their, charge their phone and their tablets. And, of course, he's thrilled that this is over with. But uh, it became very apparent uh, they couldn't keep the inventory. They were, uh, they were in high demand. Ford had about 415 generator-equipped pickups on Texas dealers' lots. The trucks still can be sold to retail. They got those out and deployed them so people could mm-hmm. use them in critical situations where there's health care concerns to keep uh, oxygen going. And so this was a new technology with a very, very good use at the time. 866-594-4150. That's the number to reach us. I want one of those trucks so bad, and I... I I'm the last person who needs it, but only boy. because it's got a generator on it, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you'd I wanna... be okay if your Solstice had a generator like that, seven point uh, two kilowatts. Well, I want to put the the DJ speakers in the back. So that you, that's what you want to do. You want to yeah, get, you want to gig out on the road. Yeah, I want to just have the the whole system set up in the back of the truck. Doesn't that sound? Yeah, it, it sounds great. <laughs> yeah, I know you know that. You could turn that on a parking lot, and you would be the king of the hill. Absolutely. That's Forget coming. putting them up on the top, you know, on the roof. My brother's Monte Carlo at the house speakers. Do it. They could, Ford could just donate a truck to you. They mm-hmm. could shoot a commercial with you out in the parking lot, be the hit of the yeah. boondocks, you know. And Chris is out there with his DJ going on. Oh, that would be great. Do you have a DJ name? DJ no. Chris. Yeah, no, not at all. You, are you hiding it? No. I mean, when no. you go do a gig that nobody knows you're, you're doing back in the day and you're just showing up at this major wedding dance, no. do you go undercover? No, I, no. I don't, I don't do, no. I, 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 I haven't done it for a long, long How time. How many but, disco balls do you own? Three. <laughs> three? <laughs> <laughs> One is... One is hardwired into the garage. We talked about yes. that. Uh, there's a wall switch where when I hit that, everything lights up. Oh, uh, I, not I, the sound. That's a separate. Okay. Way, but, yeah, one. if you hit the wrong switch in my garage, the lights won't come on. The lights will come on. Do I, do I <laughs> dare ask where the other one is at? <laughs> uh, I have one in, one in the stuff. We, we have some of the stuff left, and it's in a box oh, okay. ready to go. Yeah. Okay. I thought maybe Diane would have to point it out. <laughs> No, shockingly enough, she never went for that idea. I huh? suggested it many times. Some people have a deer mount. Yeah. Some people have a disco ball. That's right. <laughs> 866-594-4150. I was uh, thinking of you specifically, oh, no. Shannon. It scares me. I Uh-oh. was in traffic the other day behind a Buick Encore, <laughs> which looks like a Pontiac oh. vibe. and No. Yes, it does. No. 866-594-4151. Carry on. It totally does. It's a little different, but they're the same basic shape. Uh, and the person driving it was mid-70s or higher, was an elderly person driving. And when I look around and I see that Buick Encore, which is noticeable. That's all I'm going to say about the Buick Encore. We just sold a front clip for one this morning that was going to a body shop, delivering on the truck this morning. I noticed them. And it's usually, like you would expect from a Buick, it's an elder person, an older person. Very rarely young people driving Buicks. Careful. No, I know. Careful. I'm, They're working I, hard on this. No, I know. I'm just saying it as a fact. I, I, In my life, it's a fact. 
I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm not too. Hey, worried. I was just watching an episode of WandaVision. Mm-hmm. She left Shield has or Sword headquarters, and she was driving a Buick Regal, dude. Okay, so I would say she's probably pretty young. What is she? Thirty in that show? I don't know. Isn't she centuries old or something? You yeah, know the Buick commercial still... with the guy that's in the, that's <laughs> no. in, the, in the alley eating a sandwich, and the, they come up and the, get the person gets in the wrong car. It's my no. first cousin. In, in, the, the, in, the, in, Buick, the, in, in the Buick <laughs> National Buick commercial. Oh, well, this hasn't gone very far off the rails at all. No, but that that vibe is again young people. encore. I'm just saying that was a young person in a Buick. Sure. He's he's definitely young. So so the here's my question. Have we all just been tricked by marketing or have we really driven the market? And what I mean is my aunt, who is 88 years old, is looking at cars. I'm sure she doesn't want an SUV or a crossover. I'm sure she wants a Lincoln Continental from 1959, but she's going to go get in a, a crossover and SUV because she likes those now. One of the things does that, she really, or have we tricked everyone into it? One of the things that happened and, and speaking of just watching people buy cars. So the Cadillac DeVille's and, and Bromes and the big cruiser Cadillacs were bought by a lot of people as they were just wanting that highway cruiser. They were a little bit older in the demographic. They kept buying the Cadillacs. On or about 2005, 2004, 2006, Cadillacs started sportying up their lineup. They didn't make what you would call the Cruiser anymore. Even the, the DeVille became the DTS. Uh, the Seville became the STS. And then they started getting all these sport variants. And the performance and the feel of the cars went to more of a road car for for a driving enthusiast than a road car for somebody looking for a couch going down the road mm -hmm. a number of people that i know bought into those next generation of cadillacs and they they kind of liked it it surprised me i i thought they wouldn't like it but they kind of liked that sportier feel it's almost like they've been missing it mm -hmm. but they're so you see the same thing with them the reason i'm going to there's buick buyers that there's a big difference between the Buick LeSabre or Park Avenue or, or something that they bought in 1985, 1990, 1992, and then all of a sudden you got to, I'm going to buy, what's my choice? Oh, I can buy a LaCrosse, a Lucerne on about 2005. The choices became different. The cars look different. Right. But those people kept buying Buicks but not at the rate that they were, and they were trying to get that crossover buyer to come back. So I think there's two things going on. The brand loyalty did stick to a certain extent, but not enough because they had to change it because they, right. they, they, they didn't have enough buyers. And I just mean in general that SUV, the whole thing now that we don't make cars, we just make crossovers and, and up. Is that a real thing or is that? marketed to us and is is there a difference maybe it's the same thing you just made me think of something though i think that i've never thought of is that the explorer yeah, is, game the, changer. is the game changer yep. and there were kids that were from five years old to 25 years old when the explorer came out who grew up with the explorer wanted an explorer and, and liked it, those and, and got you're, it. You're, you're hitting a nail on the head and right now, now they're 50 yep. so they're they want an explorer whether they know it or not you know they want. It's like, the same I wanted reason, a Trans Am. It's the same reason they play our music in the kids' TV shows. Right. Yes, so you're exactly right. It's the same thing. They know. So I think we are being tricked to a certain extent, but we caused it to start with. Eight six six five nine four four one five zero. We're going to take a break. We're going to talk to Jeff when we get back, and we want to talk to you. Eight six six five nine four four one five zero. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show. Under the Hood Show. Welcome back to the Under the Hood Show. The phone number to reach us, 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Jeff. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Jeff, what can we do for you? Oh, i got to push this button now. As a 2012 uh, Toyota Camry XLE four-cylinder, and the other day it started shifting rough or going from second to third. 
and she brought it in. The, they said she needed a transmission. She brought it somewhere else, and they reset the CP or the brains of it, and it hasn't. It's been shifting normal for now. I don't know if you guys had any experience with that or not, or what might be the deal. Yeah. It, so whenever they reset any auto place resets a engine computer, it's going to go back to what the factory had it set for. But if you've got wear going on in a transmission or an engine or something like that, and the tra- and the engine computer powertrain control module for the transmission, all that starts adjusting and adapting to make up for whatever the failure is in that part, it'll start doing it again. So it's, it's, it's very possible that you do need a transmission, but a transmission shop or a good independent repair shop is going to be able to diagnose that. We, we look at them and we look at clutch values and things and explain, the, explain what that means Russ. When you say a clutch value, what does that mean to somebody? How much, how much uh, fluid pressure the transmission is having to apply in order to keep that clutch from slipping. So if it says, Hey, this thing's super worn, well, it's applying a lot of a lot of fluid to it and a lot of pressure in order to keep it going. It's having to turn up the pressure in the transmission in order to keep it from slipping. It can only reach a certain value, and then it says we can't adapt anymore. And in General Motors, they call it a maximum adapt and a long shift. It took too long to shift, so they know that it's it's slipping inside, and that's a that's a death sentence for a GM transmission. Typically, is when you get a max adapt long shift. It's you've checked all the solenoids, everything's working, and it's just worn out. It's not just going to be a simple, I can reset something. So on yours, it's very possible that the transmission is going out. Okay, yeah, because they had eighty thousand miles on, it seemed kind of premature, but that never, is, I guess nothing's perfect. Well, but, that is low for a for a camera. I'm going to say that's really low. So it it is very possible that something just went a little berserk in the programming, and a reset was needed to reprogram it. But like Russ is saying, there are things that they can check, and they can tell you, here, no, we check this. Here's the pressures on each, you know, clutch number three, clutch number four. They can go through all that stuff and find it, and tell you with some scientific knowledge. Yep. Not just say your trance is bad, and you you're definitely going to want that before you buy into the bad transmission story. You don't want to have to yeah. do that. Yeah. Got, yeah. No. No. Not really. But. Uh, you know, yeah, the the guy at the transmission shop in town here, he said, well, try that. And said, when it acts up again, bring it in and we can check it further. Yeah, I think I would do just that. If, if everything's still working good. And we, we often do tell people, you can't pull the dipstick on as many transmissions as you used to and just look at it. But if they inspect the fluid and the fluid is still looking good, it's not smelling burnt, it's not showing signs of slippage, be encouraged that it could have just been a, a fluke in the wire, uh, in the uh, programming that just, Got out of whack, and it, it can happen, just like your home computer sometimes has to be restarted. Jeff, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. How do you check the fluid on a car without, do you have to drain some? Do you have to? Well, several ways. Some of them have a cap that comes off, and then you have to buy a dipstick, which is a gauge. It For Chrysler's, we have them, and it works on multiple vehicles. Some of the Fords are that way, too. You put it in, it registers a number in millimeters, and you just compare it to the chart and the temperature to see where it's at. And then you put the cap back on, you're done. Other ones, you have to raise it on a hoist and look at the service manual. Is it in park? Is it in neutral? Is it in drive? Where is it at in order to check it and what temperature it's at, which means you need a scan tool to read the temperature of the trans. So, uh, for instance, the other day I was working on, it happened to be in an Audi. I raised it on the hoist. I got the scanner out. I watched the scanner, and I saw that it said 70 degrees. And it said it's 70 degrees with this inspection plug out of the bottom of it. It should be starting to drip out, just very slowly, drip, drip. And at 80, it should be a pretty steady stream. So you pull it out. You watch it. I'm watching it 65, 66, 10 minutes later, 69. Five minutes later, 70, drip, drip. Okay, okay. Uh, it's full. Put the plug back in. That's how you test these things. Which You'd think be, an Audi would be easier because it, would, it wouldn't have to go any to get. Just waiting for one of us to yeah, make that joke. Yeah. I was trying to think of a good one, and yeah. I couldn't do so, it. Me neither. You tried way too hard. <laughs> More difficulty. Why they can't put a stick on there? 
Well, the same reason that they make you walk through the casino in Vegas to get anywhere. They want to put a chopstick or something down in there and dip it in the. All right. No, they want you. They want you back in for service. I don't like it. And a lot of people, if you say, "I have a car," I'm selling you this car, Chris. You need to make repairs on it. Well. A lot of people still think, well, I got to go to the dealer. That's the only place I can get it fixed, which is just not true. You can go a lot of places, but still they have a large number. So if they put that plug in there, maybe they can get some people in. Hey, it's a good business tactic for them. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Don. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Don, what can we do for you? Hey, good morning, guys. Hey, I have a 2004 Buick LeSabre. It's got 192,000 miles. Anyway... When I shut the car off, you know, pull the key out, get out of the car, the uh, the door alarm goes ding, 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 you know. My tail lights stay on, and my interior lights stay on for 10 minutes. So what's going on? Well, you most likely are having a problem with the latch mechanism inside the door. That's where the sensor is at that tells the door that it's shut. And if, the, and if you tell the door that it's shut and you have, excuse me, if the car is not getting told the door that it's shut, then eventually a shutdown relay will take over and power everything down. Okay. I, so so I'm think, it's just not getting the signal that the door is actually shut. And it would be is that, that that's And that's how it's acting, right? It's well, not getting a signal. But why, but why, when you pull the key out, why does... Why does the, the door alarm keep dinging? Well, the, I mean, the key is out. You, oh, okay. You've got two things going on there. There is a sensor in a, just a little button tab inside of the steering column. It has to be off in order to ding. It won't ding with it on. But it's that senses if there's a key in there and then a door is open. Uh, so you can have two things going on. I think you've got a problem in the switch but you may also have a problem in the door latch because, like Shannon says, it's not sensing that the door is open, so it's not shutting off the power. The retained accessory power relay is staying on. That is part of the body control module, and in the worst case, the module may have failed, and it's not sensing either one. There's nothing wrong with the switch, nothing wrong with the door latch. It just doesn't know what's going on because it's doing two things at once. What do you do when you bring that in? What's, for, what's your checks? How do you Scanner. I'm looking at a scanner and reading the body control module. I'm going to see is the key in the ignition, yes or no? If it says the key's in it when the key's out, and then I use my meter and I check that ignition switch and I see that, no, the circuit's open, there's no key in there, body control module's bad. If I open the door and it says the door is still closed and I check the wire on the door and I see that that circuit is is open, that means the door, you know, opening and closing as I open the door, then I know the body control module's bad, but I'm not going to put that part in until I know for sure. Can I just put a toggle switch on it so I can just... When I'm getting out, just click it, turn it off. You could if the body control module wasn't bad. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think you may have a bad body control module after after running that through our heads. But get that in and get it scanned. That's the next step, Don. Thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. That's the number to reach us. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show. Prepare to learn something. You're going Under the Hood. Welcome back to the Under the Hood Show. The phone number to reach us, 866-594-4150. Don't forget, if you can join us on Facebook and like our Facebook page and then join the Hoodie Fan Club at underthehoodshow.com, you could win a hoodie. You can. Just a second here. We get a winner? I know his name. Like, uh, <laughs> it's 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 Laith. Uh, uh, there it is. Got it. We were, we were trying to be real s- sterile Subtle. and keep, keep our papers hidden. Oh, yeah. And sometimes we hide too much. Well, <laughs> I, kn- I knew it wasn't last week's winner or the winner of the week before or the winner before <laughs> that, so it had to be this one. <laughs> Lath Grand Guard from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Congratulations. Congratulations from all of us here under the hood. It'll just magically show up at your, mm-hmm. on your doorstep. Uh, and our friends over at UTI, Universal Technical Institute, our sponsor in that hoodie giveaway. That's the place to go. If you're thinking about a career in automotive, you, you got to start somewhere that has good 
training that that supports um, the correct, accurate training of techs because you you can't just expect to go get a job and and work at most places unless somebody's going to take you under their wing and train you. And a lot of these shops don't want that. It's a lot of work. So they, they want somebody that's trained by a reputable place and universal technical Institute is going to be that place. They're working with the manufacturers directly. They can get you what you need to be a top notch technician. So check them out today. They got campuses all over the country. UTI.edu. Let's talk to rich rich. You're on the under the hood show. What can we do for you? Hey, gentlemen, how are you guys? Fantastic. Quick, good, good. Quick question for you. Electrical problem in a uh, 2000 Sierra GMC. Um, the dome lights inside are not working. I keep blowing fuses once I put one in there. So I turn the truck on, and then I put a fuse in, and it holds. The lights are on. I turn it off. The lights hold on, go off like normal. But then as soon as I turn that vehicle back on, the fuse blows and the light on the message center, message sensor, or sorry, the little little screen there. Information on the center. Dashboard yep. says, information center. Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> it says, um, what's that, whatever that light on the back of the, the back of the hood there. So you can see in the back of your pickup bed. Car- cargo, cargo lamp. Cab light. Yes. It says that. It just says cargo lamp. That's that's all. That's all I'm seeing. Oh my! But I, I don't know. I'm kind of kind of stuck there. I didn't see either of you react the in the affirmative. Apart. I didn't see either of you react in the. You didn't start nodding or or. I didn't see a light bulb go off on either of your face. He saw plenty of them go off. That's yeah, the, for sure. the cargo lamp. That warning is supposed to come on and tell you you've left your cargo lamp on when you're going down the road and on the newer ones, when you put it in gear and try to go forward, uh, they'll shut off when you reach, I think it's 15 miles an hour or something like that. Cause you may be moving the truck with the light on at a campground very slowly and they leave the light on. But once you start rolling, it shuts it down. That's what that is. He, he, something is, if it's only coming on, you know, you put a fuse in it and it doesn't blow it. I wonder how that was arrived at to know you could put it in. I suppose he, you just had it running and he says, I'll swap the fuse while it's running and said, Oh, look, the lights on. That's weird. Let's shut it off. Now it blows it. How'd you figure that out, Rich? Uh, lots of fuses. <laughs> <laughs> just plugging them in one after another. How, Eventually how the timing many? was how many work. are we oh, up I'm, to? I'm an electrician. That's what I do. I just put it in and watch it blow. <laughs> how, how many fuses have you used now? Uh, I'd, I'd say what, maybe a couple uh, little boxes, 10, what's that? Five in each. <laughs> They do make a little device you can plug into those. I thought he was going to say they do make bigger boxes you can buy. No, they make a device that you can plug in, and it has a little alarm, a little smoke detector alarm siren on it. So when it's shorted, it'll beep. When it's not shorted, it'll disconnect the circuit. So if it sees too much load, it beep. and Oh, hey, that thing's shorted. So then if you were to turn the car off and back on, it would be shorted. You start it up, unhook it, it would not be there. But... This is going to be uh, not real fun to diagnose. That sounds like something an electrician should have, too. I, I, I want one. I yeah. think that he was starting to say when we potted him down that he, did you tear the cargo lamp apart, you said? Yes, pull, pulled it out, unhooked it completely, and it still did the same thing. Oh, gosh, I had a theory, but I used, a month later, just blew that out of the water. A month later, I go down the road and I throw a fuse in going out to Seattle and it works for three or four weeks on and off truck works, works just like normal. And I get back, maybe it's, maybe it's this year in Sioux Falls. Now I get back <laughs> here and I, as soon as I pull in here a week later, it stops working again. I think you're going to have to drop the headliner and, or, and, and or it may not be the complete headliner, but mm-hmm. follow that wiring inside the cab that goes back to that dome light. And I just mm-hmm. wonder if that wire is somewhere where it comes down on the center pillar on the floorboard, if that wire might not have got corrosion on it. Driver's it's... side center pillar between the doors. This is a four door, right? No, no two thousand uh, would be an extended door. cab. Is it an extended right. cab? Does it? Does yes, it have? It does it have? Oh, okay, only the passenger door open. Three All right, door. three so door it's a cab. Three door extend. Okay, look on the driver's side post where it comes down and meets the floor and see if there is corrosion right there. Like kind of like what Shannon was saying, I had the same problem in mine. It once since I bought it, it never had dome lights that worked inside. 
and I, I would put a fuse in it and it would just blow it. And when I had it apart a couple of years ago, I had the, the whole carpet out to replace the, put some new carpet in it. When I had it out, sure enough, I saw that wire that was just rubbed through, chafed, rubbed through just barely. It was stained with rust. And I went, well, that's weird. What's going on there? And I stretched it a little bit and looked real close and I could see a shiny piece of metal in there. And I said, this is shorted. So I just took that and clipped it out and put a butt connector in there and put a piece of tape around it to protect it, put a fuse in it, and they work fine. Russ, I got a question that is going to, it's burning me up, and I think I know the answer. That's maybe why I'm asking the question. When you go on a project for your own vehicle and you know you're after one thing, how do you stop yourself from looking at everything else around it and not, that's a challenge for you, isn't it? Well, I don't. I fix everything. That's, I mean, you Mm -hmm. can't, he can't go on a focus mission. No, 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 no. I would think that, yeah. No, I fixed everything. Yeah. I, yeah. I say, well, I'm just going to put carpet in it. Yeah. Oh, no, no. And he ended up with a new transmission. Well, no, that was <laughs> separate. <laughs> Rich, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. All I could think was when he said, oh, I peeled the carpet back, and then I looked real close. I immediately thought, I remember when I could look real close. That was great. Now I'd have to go in the house and try and find the glasses and a light. Let's talk to Tom. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Tom, what can we do for you? Tom, are you there? All right, let's do this quick. Tom, you're on can the you Under the Hood. Can you hear me now? Now I can. Tom, go ahead. Perfect. Perfect. I got a 2003 uh, Silverado 1500 HD with the 6.0 motor. Um, it seems like the fan's always engaged the cooling fan on the truck. So like as you're revving up, driving, getting on the interstate, it seems like that fan's going all out all the time. Um, I switched out the fan clutch with the one I got at Napa. It's a HD fan clutch and it does the same thing. And I was reading some forms online. Are there the OEM one, the AC Delco one, does it, is it not engaged as much? I'm trying to figure that out because I don't need it to run all the time. I don't have an overheating issue or anything, but it's pulling a lot of power out of it. There are different fan clutches available, which give you uh, different engagements and they're, they go by gear ratio in the rear end so that it knows what, what speed the truck's going. So if you've got one for a high gear ratio, it knows that the engine is going to be turning a higher RPM at let's say 40 miles an hour than it would if it was a um or if it was a low gear ratio so you're you're getting a higher speed it it knows like if you're going 40 i should be turning faster rpms if you put the wrong one in and it thinks you know it doesn't know what gear ratio you have because you put the wrong one in there it senses that uh, that lower rpm and thinks it's it should still be engaged so you need to get the correct one for the gears that are are in the truck in order to get it to disengage quicker and more of them lean towards the side of staying engaged longer than not engaged enough to keep them cool and a few of them after they run a little while they'll break in after they've been in there for six months to a year they'll they'll loosen up a little bit anyways and for the hoodies that are listening that most of you don't have a fan clutch all electric now it's, and so it's all controlled by the computer when that fan's going to run. Back when we used to just learn about inventory when we were dismantling the cars, we used to have to take those fan clutches and you'd have to get the cleaner out and you'd have to find the letter code on them because the General Motors ones are thermostatically controlled and they'd have different letter codes on them. And so the, the spring tension would be different so that at different heats and temperatures it would determine how much fan it gave it versus freewheeling. Right. And eventually they would wear out and they'd start leaking oil out the back. And so there's a lot more to that stupid looking fan clutch than most people realize. Does that help you out there, Tom? Kind of. <laughs> yeah, well, but, he, but, he's, but he's, there... saying, he's saying he ordered his, I'm guessing, by did you give him your VIN number and they said this is the clutch you need or did they just, here's a fan clutch from AC Delco. How, how'd that go? So I, I went into Napa and T and, and he just pulled up the truck all the general information they needed. And he said, you know, they had two options. One was 60 bucks and one was 120 bucks. And he's like, well, they're the same thing. And it points the the code right back to this one. He's like, so I'm just going to sell you the cheaper one. Some of the aftermarket replacements the alternative pieces that are less money and of good quality 
are not identical to what the OEM spec was. And what we just described for the last few minutes is part of that. Okay. So you, you get a fan clutch, but it may not be engineered exactly the same way as the one was that came with the truck brand new. And might not be programmed to well, the detail. Pro- this isn't a programming I mean, thing. In, in the chip created, itself. No, this is a mechanical device. Okay. This is a mechanical device. It may not be created That's in what the I same meant, fashion as what it is. So I would definitely uh, consider a different a different one uh, to be replaced. But make sure your fan shroud is, re- is, is in place correctly. Uh, make sure all of that mechanism that's around there is in good shape. But otherwise, there's only one more place to go, and that's back to the fan clutch itself. Tom, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Vru. You're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Hello. Hi there. Go ahead. Drew. Yep, it's uh, Drew. Oh, Drew. Okay. Uh, I I have a 2006 Pontiac Grand Prix with the supercharger in it. Fun. Series 3. I uh, just wondering, uh, what would be the best fuel for it? Because I know, uh, um, if you don't have the right octane, it'll start to ping. Yeah, you're getting in. So I'm just, you're getting into an older one that has been running on probably regular fuel for a long time. That car should be using premium because of the um, the octane needed for that in. Some of the newer cars, we've been running E30 in our own because we get the higher octane and they're cleaner fuel systems, they're newer cars, and we're not having the issues. Uh, ethanol is a, a biofuel that really likes to clean uh, well. That's why it keeps the systems clean. So the more content you have, the cleaner it's going to be. And a problem you'll run into with an old car you, know, you can run E15 in a car 2001 and up, and that's certified fine for that. But when you start getting into a higher one for higher octane, it's going to really clean that tank out, and you might end up putting some fuel filters. In but at the car. end of the day, you need octane. Yeah. You, you either need an octane booster, you got to buy the higher octane fuel, and with the wear that engine has in it and the carbon buildup, it's even going to become more necessary. So get an octane booster, or like I said, you can run the ethanol blended fuel up a little bit higher on octane, but just prepared for maybe a fuel filter just as it cleans some of that old remaining stuff left from the gasoline Mm. out of the system. Drew, thanks very much for the call. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. The phone number to reach us, 866-594-4150. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show. Dramatics. Welcome back to the Under the Hood Show. The phone number to reach us, 866-594-4150. Let's go to Georgia and talk to Steve. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Steve, what can we do for you? Yeah, good morning. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I've been struggling since last September. First, all my plugs went bad. It's a 2013 uh, expedition uh, with 4.5, and uh, the plugs we identified to go all gone bad or some of them have gone bad. So we placed them and everything went back to normal. It was running herky jerky. But at the time I noticed my timing chain was clicking and well, as time went on, that got a whole lot better as with the new plugs right away. But a month later, um, I popped a, well, in, um, it actually was a three oh uh, oh three one six code for misfire on number two on startup. And, uh, it don't, yeah, it only comes on startup and when it's cold. If the car's warm, it's nothing. But an independent mechanic, he's got a sophisticated computer. In fact, my little handheld one was showing it as a 302. But he said it's actually a, a E0316. And off a drivetrain resource, I've got some real good information. So what we did was uh, swapped out the coils and the plug. Of course, it still went back to number two. Um, I put an OEM plug, an OEM coil on there a guy who was a master mechanic, a Ford mecha- master mechanic, recommended that because he said sometimes he had problems with those coils. Uh, put a fuel injector in. Uh, uh, everything seems to run on the computer. It runs perfect um, down the road or in the shop don't, as long as it's warm. But when it pops that code, actually the car is shaking just a little bit. If, if I goose it, it settles down and goes through its that you know that high idle period of time when it when the computers do its thing and figure out what's going on when you first start a car. If I goose it a little bit, it seems not to want to pop that code. If I started cold and don't do that, it does it. But 
it did it again this morning. It wasn't that cold down here today. I don't think it got below 50 degrees. And I did goose a little, but it popped again. And and uh, like if I drive it, it rides like it's a new car, a brand new car. I mean, it's just and it doesn't pop any other code. And it's just been I don't know what else to do <laughs> other than just live with it. 13 Expedition with a 4.6 liter, correct? 4.5, I think. Okay. I think it's a 4.5. Yeah, it should be a 4.6 or a 5.4 most likely in there. But regardless, 5.4. 5.4. Yeah, that five, four. That, that makes five. more sense. That would be more common. If it's just doing it on cold startup and you've replaced the plug and the coil and the injector, that leaves just a few things left in there. You've got to do a compression check and a leak down test, but it's, it's running perfect when it's warm. I'm wondering if it's possible that you've got a, a valve that's hanging open a little bit. It could have some carbon on it. It could be bent a little bit. Anything that's keeping that open just a little bit would cause this problem. The other thing that could do it is if you have severe wear in those timing chains and they're making noise, it could be off just enough that it's causing a little bit of misfire on startup. And it may be, it, it won't just affect one cylinder. As people are thinking, well, that's not going to affect one cylinder. Well, you're right. It won't affect one, but it may be affecting all of them on one bank or both sides, but just not as far. You might have a little more wear in one cylinder, so you're getting right on the edge. And the next thing will be more cylinders showing that when it starts up, especially since you've got a, a hard misfire code in there as well. On number two, I'm thinking that, I would do a leak down test and a compression test on that cylinder. I'd do all four on that bank just so you could compare them all and see if there's a major difference on that one cylinder compared to the rest. Does that help you out there, Steve? He did do a compression on that. Okay. He did do a compression on that on that one. I don't know if we did a leak down, but do he a did leak do down. A compression. He said everything checked out. Do the leak down test when the engine's cold before you start it. Let it sit overnight, then do a leak down test on all four cylinders and compare them because, and then do it again once it's warmed up and see, and if it's fine when it's warm and not when it's cold, that would indicate a valve that's not seating all the way. The more, one of the more common things on there would be a timing chain problem, tensioner problem that could get to, I'm still working okay, but I'm right on the edge. You can get car. So if, what does he do if it, if he does find out that it's got leak down when it's cold, but not when it's warm, that would be a, a, a good place for our partner B12 with the chem tool and cleaning in there because if, it, if you, the carbon is what sticks that you get carbon gets up on the back of the valves and it can make its way down in there and you got to be careful you don't want to overload that cylinder but it's very important to keep that clean that area clean because if it gets if it gets too much in there it's going to hang the valve open but that would be an indication of where um, a cleaner like ChemTool is indicated, is when it's just cold, not warm. And once you get it clean, then you can determine, do I have other things like a bent valve? But bending valves on one of those is very unlikely. Carbon in the cylinder is likely. Steve, thanks very much for the call. What I took from that was that if you're going to do it cold and warm, start cold. Because if you did it warm and then you were going to wait for it to get cold, I would never get it accurate i would always just hope for the best so You'd i never would, wait for the conditions to be right, right. i would go oh it, it's probably cold enough now oh it, it's still broken no i'll wait a little longer and i just would never trust I, it i was just thinking of the warm test and how close my hands would be to really warm things and how, how careful the technician has to be doing all that work. careful whenever you're working on an engine you need to be careful whether it's warm or cold it's just you know, rotating parts moving parts hot parts Cold parts. Uh, you could burn your hands on the excessive cold around here sometimes. Recently, yeah. yeah. When's the last time you burnt your hand really good? Mm, a while ago. Shannon? And I, I, it seems like I've done it recently. I, I'm trying to think what it was. Shopped a big hole in there, you know. But yeah, yeah, you. That's the most recent I, thing. The thing that I can look at you and see various things over the years, I'm the, his hand when he did that, yeah, he had you got, this. You got the forehead, the, the big scar forehead on the from forehead the, from yeah. the. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that is uh, one thing different now with the with my fun car that I have versus my old car that I have uh, or had. My old Volkswagen, a lot of places to burn yourself on that car. A lot of places. Uh, it and it got hot quick. That engine, it 
You drive that thing for three minutes and you had to stay away from it for an hour. Two hot tailpipes sticking out the back end. Way out. I mean, you know, six inches out the back. If anything, the government could have discontinued (laughs) that car just for two hot tailpipes. They should have been the early version to have the heat diffractor on them you know the yes heat sink with like the big diesels have on the back they make those as an aftermarket you get two big fat pipes that went over the mm-hmm. made them sound i could have used that because i burnt my side burnt my forearm on that really good and then when a when the when the uh plugs would the, the wires would just pop off the plugs oh, while yeah. i was driving down the road and i had to go put those back on and it was hot. oh man i think my last good burn was underneath the dash of a 79 trans am Working on some wires, and I got my hand up against the light dome bulb, light? the dome light bulb. Oh, that'll, the, that'll the, lower, the lower light bulb. <laughs> that'll cook you. That that I, I think there was some skin, and it's a sneaky one too, because well, you don't feel it right away. No, do you? and then also it's yeah. oh, that's not good. That'll do it for another hour of the Under the Hood Show. Until next time, you can find us online at underthehoodshow.com. And don't forget to join us on Facebook and on YouTube. We'd love to have you check out the Under the Hood Show live. The Under the Hood Show is brought to you by Sturdivitz. We'll see you next time.